Chapter Fourteen. Mass rallies were held every night. Students sang revolutionary songs and marched through campus, pounding on drums and cymbals while chanting slogans. The incessant nocturnal cacophony kept us awake. The admiring and attentive students who once crowded Papa's classes and called him Mr. Chips seemed transformed overnight into a crowding and hateful herd. The nearby thunder of their rallies sent chills of fear through me. Before long, militant students. Became bolder and began seizing those they termed class enemies, dragging them to the university's athletic grounds for public interrogation and punishment. They vowed to expose every enemy of the people. They came for Papa on the night of June six. As their Boisterous procession neared our building. The windows rattled with the resonance of their poisonous invective and bluster. Then, all of a sudden, the shouting and the drumming ceased. A single voice barked out orders. The crowd. Explored, exploded with a cry, "Down with Wu Ningkun! Down with the U.S. spy!" The monster I'd imagined, the one Papa cried about night after night, was now downstairs screaming his name. The door to the building crashed open, followed. By a rumble of footsteps rushing up the stairs, I wanted to run and hide. Where? I wanted to fly away. How? There was pounding on our door. Several voices cried together, "Let us in, or we'll break your door down." You filthy American spy! Grandmother parted her mosquito net, slipped from her bed, and hobbled through the dark to the door. The moment she unbolted the door, it was flung open as if by a blast of wind. Students scrambled through the door and ran. Ran down the hall. A student switched on the light in our room and screamed, "Where is the bastard Wu Ningkun?" I recognized Chen Chongde. He had visited our apartment many times to speak with Papa and receive. Tutoring, Papa told us he was from a good peasant background, but was slow, so he'd been assigned to Papa for special help. Our eyes met for a moment. He was a startling contrast. To that of the differential, self-conscious student I'd known. I'm the head of the Cultural Revolution Committee. He shrieked. Where is that arch criminal Wu Ningkun hiding? From the next room came a cry. We have him. Chen Chongde rushed to the next room. Two students seized Papa by the arms and hair and shouted, "Come with us, you spy!" Papa appeared at the door, 
held tightly by students. He was wearing only boxer shorts and a T-shirt. He was barefoot. My throat constricted, and I let out a long, desperate cry. Papa! My brother clung to me tightly, crying. Grandmother stood pinned against the wall by an enraged student. All the color had drained from her face. Her lips moved, but her words stuck in her throat. "Don't be afraid, Mama," Papa said, turning to me. "I'll be back soon." He forced a brave smile just before a student grasped the back of his neck and gave him a violent push. Papa stumbled out of my sight. There was an eruption of shouting and cheering outside when those who'd invaded our apartment appeared with Papa. A dozen professors who had been seized earlier were held by the crowd. Papa joined the group, and the mob departed. Pounding their drums and cymbals, and triumphantly bearing the professors as their prizes, they proceeded to the university athletic grounds. Where nearly four thousand students had gathered for the spectacle, the professors were lined up on the basketball court and forced to their knees. They were spat on, slapped, slugged, kicked, and punched by their tormentors. Chen Chongde frequently interrupted the rough treatment. To proclaim his contempt for Papa, he finished each of the diet trips by slapping Papa hard across the face. Papa and his colleagues were designated cow demons by their captors. Chen Chongde proclaimed in a piercing voice that was beyond the question. That the cow demons had conspired to overthrow the socialist revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat, but their plans had been foiled when the students joined together and rose up to crush the counter-revolution. The hysteria of the denunciations increased by the minute. Then, almost as quickly. As it began, it ended. The students broke into the chant, "Long live the great leader Chairman Mao! Long, long live the great leader Chairman Mao!" Chen Songde led the cheer and pumped his fist in the air with each repetition. When he was finished, he smirked at the kneeling professors and then. Sauntered away. The students dispersed, and left the cow demons kneeling on the ground. One by one, they stood, some with difficulty. Without a word to one another, they too trudged through the night back to their apartment. I lay staring into the darkness, listening to the voices and drums in the distance. When they stopped, I could hear the beating of my heart. Mama came to my bedside, holding my little brother, to assure us that everything would be all right. A short time later, I heard shuffling outside. And then, through the mesh of my mosquito net, saw Papa's hunched shadow. What happened? Mama asked. Oh, nothing, he 
he said, and gave a tired chuckle. I have to show up for political study tomorrow morning at eight. <sighs> but I'm not alone anymore. The entire department consists of criminals and suspects now. We're all equal cow demons. The next morning, I watched Papa as he prepared to depart. The side of his face was swollen and bruised, and he had difficulty walking, as if his feet had been bound when he was young. Forty faculty members were herded into a classroom to hear a party official warn them of the grave nature of their crimes. The official waved his fist and proclaimed, The student action last night was warranted. You brought this down on yourselves. Your plans to restore a bourgeois society have been revealed and smashed. His harangue was met by cowed silence. The accused were commanded to go home and compose confessions, telling how the beatings by the students had touched them to their very souls and to reveal why they were deserving of the beatings. The students rescued you from the commission of additional crimes. They deserve your praise. Bring your confessions tomorrow at 8 a.m. Papa went empty-handed to the next session. The other professors had obediently composed long confessions. These were not collected. The party official asked for a discussion of what had happened on the basketball court. One after another, professors agreed that what had happened was wonderful. The students woke us up and reminded us of how heinous our crimes are, said one elderly professor. The others, with the exception of Papa, chorused assent. Another volunteered, we're all criminals. The students were cracked to do what they did. In fact, they were far more lenient than they should have been, and I am grateful for that. Papa listened with increasing despondency. In fact, the confessing professor gushed, we deserve to be shot. Each and every one of us deserves to be shot. His words were followed by a cry of agreement from the others. Some were clearly dismayed that they had not been the first to offer to be shot. We must make up for our crimes against the people, a female professor interjected. We must make up for our crimes and uh, and make up for the fact that we have failed the students and we have failed the people. Yes, yes, the others exclaimed. The party official commended their self-condemnation. Very good, excellent, in fact, just excellent. The meeting was interrupted by an announcement over the public address system that university officials had been relieved of their duties 
and that the administration of the school was to be taken over by a working committee of the People's Liberation Army, PLA. Before dismissing the professors, the party official directed, You all did all very, very well today. Now, go home and write down your confessions. He'd forgotten that he'd already given that assignment. The next day, the professors gathered, but the party official did not show up. Each professor, with the exception of Papa, carried his expanded confession and expressed eagerness to present it. Mama work, Mama's work group also devoted itself to daily political study and confessions. Routine academic activities were suspended and forgotten. In the following days, a large number of soldiers moved onto campus and assumed administration of the university. Soldiers also moved into posts throughout the city of Hefei and took charge of the government. With the onset of summer vacation, however, nearly all the students departed from campus and the flame of revolution in Hefei seemed to have been nearly extinguished. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15. Students crowded onto trains that summer as transportation was free. They traveled around the country visiting historic revolutionary sites and seeing how students were making revolution in other parts of China. Some young red faculty members joined them. A mandatory destination was Beijing, where the Cultural Revolution was born and where Tiananmen Mall, the reddest, reddest sun of our hearts, presided. The students rallied there by the hundreds of thousands read and composed posters, exchanged ideas, and stoked their enthusiasm for revolution. Papa was recapped as a rightist. He told Mama that all faculty members and administrators were suspect, capped or uncapped. No one knew what fate awaited him. My parents spoke in lower tones, as if they feared being overheard by someone listening in the hallway or outside. Grandmother was tense and nervous. She jumped at the slightest noise. At night, she sat on her bed and stared at the wall, lost in confusion and fear. My older brother spent hours playing chess against himself. Sometimes I watched him and envied his ability to lose himself so completely in the game. My younger brother constantly clung to our father or mother. I feared our home might be invaded again. I had nightmares. The soldiers on campus and in the city provided some sense of security. The PLA was the champion of the people. The sight of a soldier was always reassuring. They could be depended upon, I believe to maintain order and 
prevent injustice. I was taught that the soldiers were heroes. I envied children from red families who might someday become PLA soldiers. During the third week of June, I began to suffer from a severe toothache. I didn't want to bother Mama or Papa with my problem. I examined my mouth in the mirror and found a blackened tooth at the back with the gum swollen around it. I tried to pull the tooth out with my fingers, but it would not budge. I asked Xiaolan to help me, but she was unable to extract it. I decided to visit a dentist. The next morning, I set out for the city's only dental hospital. It was several miles away in the downtown area of Hefei. I had only enough money for a one-way bus ride. I decided to take the bus to the dental hospital to make sure I got in line early for the treatment. I planned to walk home. After asking around, I located the large facility. I hurried inside, waited in line, paid my five fun fee, and after an hour was summoned to a cavernous room with many dental chairs, nurses, and dentists. I dressed nicely that morning in my red and black checkered blouse and black trousers. I wanted to look like a responsible girl. Why are you here? the nurse asked. My tooth hurt, I said, opening my mouth and pointing inside. She said a dentist would take care of it. I was surrounded by patients being tended by dentists. Some of them were moaning as the dentists worked on them. I began to feel anxious. A dentist came to my chair. He examined the tooth. It's rotting away, he concluded. I should remove it. That's okay, I assured him. He cautioned, this will hurt. You can come back another time with your mother. I'd like it fixed now, I insisted. You are a brave girl, he said with surprise. He told the nurse to give me a shot of Novocaine and he waited for it to take effect. Neither the dentist nor the nurse was skilled. Several times they tried and failed to pull out the tooth. The dentist moved from one side of the chair to the other and traded place with the nurse. He tried to get the tooth from the new angle, and after another failure, finally succeeded. I didn't make a sound. The dentist held up the extracted tooth for me to see. Keep the area around the tooth clean, he instructed me. The nurse told me to rinse my mouth over a basin and put a cotton ball in the hole to stop the bleeding. Before I left, she gave me a small bag of clean cotton balls to use later. I was dizzy. I sat down outside the clinic for several minutes before I began my long walk home. I often felt inside my mouth to see if the cotton 
was saturated. Whenever it was, I replaced it. The day had become hot and humid, and heavy dark clouds hung in the summer sky. I was surprised by the ominous rumble of thunder and glanced up to see a single iridescent strand of lightning silver the air. I hurried, hoping to get home before the storms broke. I was caught in a heavy downpour. People darted past me, covering their heads with folded newspapers. My sandals sloshed and splashed as I walked along the flooded sidewalk. I remembered a shortcut on a path through a wooded area. I decided to take it. I turned on to one of the dirt paths leading through the area, staying close to the edge so the tall pines shielded me from the rain. As I neared the university, I started singing a popular tune praising the PLA. Uncle PLA is good, carries long guns, shoots big cannons, trains to fight day and night, defend securely motherland's gate. 扛枪枪开大炮,日日夜夜练兵忙,祖国大门收得了,祖国大门收得了。As As I hurried along, jumping over puddles, I was startled by a man, a POA soldier, who appeared suddenly out of nowhere. One moment, I was walking alone, and the next he was beside me. He was tall and somber. He held out an umbrella to shield me from the rain. I was surprised, but not afraid, because he was a soldier, and he served people. I heard you singing, he said. Where did you learn that song, little friend? In school, I replied, looking up at him and brushing rain-drenched hair out of my eyes. That's good, he said, and patted me on the head. Where are you going? I'm on my way home, Uncle PLA. And do you, and do your parents know where you are? No, Uncle P.O.A. He glanced around as if looking for someone. How old are you? Eight. He was silent for several seconds. At last, he said, I may have something for a revolutionary little singer. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a large metal disc. Do you like this? It was a badge with the raised silver profile of the great leader, Chairman Mao Zedong. Badges like this had become popular during recent weeks. They were highly prized. I'd seen ones like it, like it on the shirts of the students and faculty and the red family children. But this one was bigger and more ornate than any I'd seen before. I like it very much, Uncle Pierre. Would you like to keep it? He asked, 
and thrust it into my hand. Yes, yes, I would, Uncle P.O.A., I said, but I have no. A clap of thunder interrupted my words. You don't have what, he asked, cupping his hand to his ear and leaning closer. Money, I said. You don't have money, he asked. Well, what can be done about that? I didn't know what to say, so I waited for him to answer his own question. Come here. He took me by the arm and led me off the path and into the trees, where we were better protected from the rain by a thick canopy of branches. He folded his umbrella and put it down. Now, that's better, he said. You want this beautiful Chen Mao badge, but you don't have money for it. Is that right? Yes, he leaned closer, his face nearly touching mine, and start, stared into my eyes. I felt uncomfortable with his closeness and with the breeze of his breath on my face. I turned my head aside and looked at the trees. What's wrong with your mouth? he asked. I had my tooth pulled. Let me see, he said, taking my wrist and leading me a few steps farther into the trees. Show me where the bad tooth was. He dropped his knee to his knees on the pine needles. I opened my mouth wide and pointed to the space where the rotten tooth had been. He put his hand on my shoulder and peered into my mouth. That looks all right, he said, but is the rest of you all right? I think so, I said. Well, Let's see, he said. What? I began to ask, but quickly, deftly, before I knew what he was doing, he untied my trousers and let them drop, pulled my underwear aside and slipped his fingers between my legs. His other hand darted from my shoulder to my neck and his fingers tightened around my throat. Don't make a sound, he hissed. I need to see if you are all right. I tried to pull away, but he held me fast. Fear exploded inside me. His grip on my throat choked me, and his fingers between my legs I squirmed and squeezed my legs together tightly and attempted to free myself. I couldn't breathe. My face flushed hot. My eyes burned and my vision clouded. The more I struggled, the tighter he grasped my neck. I managed a desperate squeal. I flailed and struck his wrist and clawed it desperately at the sleeve of his tonic. Ouch, he shouted and released me. He looked in disbelief at his wrist, which was streaked with blood. I stumbled back and clutched my trousers, but before I could tie them, his hand shot out and grabbed my shirt 
and jerked me to him. He pressed his hand over my mouth and ordered, Don't move! I whimpered and gasped for air. I was sobbing, terrified. The soldier stood, towering over me. The knees of his trousers were damp and soiled. Blood covered his hand and fingers. He pulled out a handkerchief and wiped it away. He glowered at me menacingly as I tugged at my trousers and rubbed my throat. He held out his bloody hand and said, Look what you did to Uncle PLA. You hurt me, I sobbed. Don't say anything about this to anybody, he said in an oddly gentle voice. Because if you do, here his voice became steely. I will find you. Don't ever forget that. Do you understand me? Yes, I choked. I'll go get you a popsicle, he said. That will make your tooth feel better. Wait here until I come back. Okay, I said. I watched his feet back away from me and move out of the shadows and onto the dirt path. I waited and listened. Soon I heard only the hiss of the rain in the treetops. I could not stop crying. I felt between my legs where I hurt badly. My throat was burning. I gradually stepped to the edge of the path, peered out and saw the soldier walking away in the distance. The rain obscured him, but I recognized the umbrella and the green uniform. Still crying, I tightened the drawstring on my trousers and felt a sharp pain in my palm. I turned my hand over and saw a puncture wound. I noticed a shining object in the pine needles at my feet. It was the Chenmen Mao badge. I had been holding it when Uncle P.O.A. grabbed me and undid my trousers. I'd hit his hand repeatedly while holding the disc, gashing him and cutting myself with a sharp pin before I lost my grip and dropped it. I picked it up. Chairman Mao's semi-smiling face was smeared with blood. I slipped the badge into my pocket and stepped out into the downpour. I tasted blood in my mouth, felt around with my tongue and realized the cotton ball was gone. I'd swallowed it. I looked around on the ground and found the cotton balls. Many were soiled but a few were still clean. I stuck a clean one in the back of my mouth. I looked up and down the path. There was no one in sight. I ran home as fast as I could. Mama was surprised when I burst into our apartment, wet and out of breath. Where have you been? she asked. She approached me and noticed right away that my face 
was red and swollen. What happened? He asked with alarm. I had my tooth pulled. Where? At the dental hospital downtown. Where did you get these scratches? She asked, and leaned closer to examine marks on my neck and face. I hesitated for a moment before I lied. The nurse held me there when the dentist pulled my tooth. It wouldn't come out. I looked away from her eyes. As I spoke, lest my eyes betray me, my words seemed to hang in the air as Mama examined the bruises. How unusual! She exclaimed, "The nurse did this? Yes. You've been crying, Mama. Why? It hurt." Is that all? She asked, her eyes softening as she watched my expression. Yes. She touched my neck, and I was tempted to tell her what had really happened. But I was afraid if I did, the soldier would find out. And he would find me, and hurt me, even more. I said nothing about Uncle P L A to anyone. Yet, I could not forget his voice, and his eyes, and the feel of his hand choking me, and his fingers between my legs. Never. I took the Chen Mao badge from my pocket. I was unsure what to do with it. I pushed it under my pillow. I awakened abruptly in the middle of the night. When I dreamed, I heard the voice of Uncle P L A. I was trembling. I lay awake. Until dawn, thinking about what he'd done. When I heard the call of the milkman, I got out of bed. As I dressed, I noticed spots of blood on the sheet, and on my underwear. I put on clean underwear and hid the bloody pair, fearing Mama might ask me about it. That afternoon, when my parents were away, I washed the sheet and the underwear. Later that week, Mama had our photo taken, me and my two brothers, in a small, inexpensive studio near our home. She had us put on our finest clothing. I wore the same. Red and black checkered blouse I'd worn to the dental hospital. To demonstrate our love of Chairman Mao, each of us wore a badge. My brothers had small ones. I pinned on my large one. And told Mama I'd found it on the street near the dentist. Mama picked up the photograph two weeks later, and put it in our family album. In the picture, I'm standing between my brothers, smiling broadly, and my Chairman Mao badge is prominent. Papa and Mama said the picture was very good. I looked at it once. When Mama brought it home, I wanted to see if the marks on my neck were visible. They weren't. I didn't look at it again for a very 
long time. More POA soldiers arrived in Hefei in the next weeks. Everyone continued to tell heroic tales about them. I listened to the stories and repeated lines we were taught about their courage and selflessness. I sang songs praising Uncle PLA. Yet, when I saw the soldiers, I looked for the face of the man who hurt me. End of chapter fifteen.